Bienvenidos de nuevo a todos en este lunes de seminario. Este, esta vez nos toca pues, un seminario de los que denominamos Lectures y tenemos como presentadora a David, a David Charte. ¿no? Eh, David, bueno, ya todos lo conocéis, los que no seáis a lo mejor de, de Granado, incluso a lo mejor que no seáis de, de, de Jaén. Eh, pues David es ingeniero informático, está haciendo su tesis actualmente en Granada. Y, y bueno, yo quisiera comentar que esta no es la primera vez, eh, bueno, es la primera vez que había escuchado una charla de David eh, desde el punto de vista científico, pero no es la primera vez que yo eh, he escuchado hablar de David, ¿no? Y yo ya escuché una charla de David, aunque no fue directa, eh, cuando él tenía 14 años, él ni lo sabía y yo ya lo estaba escuchando y era su padre que estaba presentando uno de sus trabajos en clase. Eh, yo fui compañero de de su padre, Francisco Charte, que espero que esté por aquí. Me acuerdo que presentó pues, una de las cosas que ya hacía David, nos lo presentó en clase y nos dejó allí a estudiantes de Ingeniería Informática ya con la boca abierta. Y yo espero que aquella vez que no sea la última vez que me deje con la boca abierta y esta tarde también. Pues David, cuando tú quieras, pues eh, estamos dispuestos a escucharte. Vale, muchas gracias, Eugenio. Um, quedamos en que la hacía en inglés, ¿no? Si sí. nadie tiene inconveniente. Si nadie tiene inconveniente. Yeah. Y como se graba y eso, pues queda bien si luego la subimos en inglés. Bueno, so, uh, hi everyone, uh, good afternoon. And uh, I'm going to share my screen first. If Zoom doesn't break. All right. Can you see, can you see my screen now? Yes. Uh, okay. Please. Perfect. So yeah, um, in th in this talk, in this lecture, we we're, we're gonna see a, a, a little about uh, autoencoders. Um, so the title is an overview on applications, but in general, this is um, more of a tutorial on why. Uh, should we use autoencoders or other feature learners? Uh, what uh, is an autoencoder? How do we how do we define them? And then uh, some well some interesting applications, some interesting problems that uh, we can solve using them. So yeah, it, it is less uh, about my main thesis topic or results and more of a, of a tutorial for everyone. So if anyone uh, wants to learn more or anything, mm, they will probably find this uh, more useful. So yeah, so in order what uh, I'm going to talk about is a little motivation first. Uh, I'll try to, to justify why we need uh, from a couple of perspectives, uh, why we need uh, autoencoders or feature learners in general. Then I will define uh, more theoretically uh, what an autoencoder is, and then we will see an example, a very simple one. Uh, then I'll talk about uh, some applications, uh, some that I implemented myself, and some that can be found in the literature. Um, I gave this talk first at uh, Instituto de Astronomía de Andalucía. So uh, the applications that I chose were uh, from the astronomy field, but I think you will find them is interesting as well. And last, I'll talk a bit about uh, the, current the current situation with the software and maybe some future lines of work. So yeah, uh, well, uh, I'm probably gonna go a little fast in this first section because uh, we all know all of this. Uh, so yeah, if we organize our data, we'll probably have a table and in the horizontal axis, we have uh, all the variables. In the vertical axis, we have all the samples, right? So just setting this, not in this notation straight. Um, and what, the question that uh, we ask ourselves is, well, if n is our dimension, uh, can it be too high? Can it be a problem if our dimension is too large. And uh, another question that we can uh, ask ourselves is uh, all of these variables that I 
have collected, are they related in some way? Which is probably the case because well, in most problems, our variables are somehow uh, related to the same topic or uh, if we are conducting a survey uh, for a lot of people where um, probably the questions are related or if our variables are uh, image pixels, obviously uh, they are related to each other by some uh, distance or something. So uh, the problems that can be, that can arise when dimension increases are uh, several. First, uh, there's something known as curse of mm, dimensionality, which is very well known, and you'll probably know this. Uh, but we can see uh, visually uh, an example of this. For example, if uh, we take 100 points uh, randomly sampled in these intervals, uh, we can see that they cover uh, very well the one-dimensional dim one space. So if we take 100 points in this, in this line, in this segment, the, the line is very well covered. So if I have groups or if I have any additional information about those points, then I have the whole space very well covered. And I know a lot of information. Uh, if we have the same in 2D, two, in two so in two variables, if I have the same 100 points, then uh, our space is a little more uh, scarce. So there is little information uh, from some uh, places and a lot of information in other places. So that is common if we are uh, well, randomly sampling these points. And in 3D, then we start to have a lot of empty space. So if we have same data, same amount of data, um, we start to lose a lot of information or we start to have uh, big spaces where we do not know anything about. So that is uh, a visualization of the first kind of problem that we can have, right? Uh, as we increase the dimension of, of our data, a uh, less fraction of the space is covered and less information we have about certain points, certain, re or certain regions of the space. And then uh, we can have this result uh, summarized more formally. Uh, in in well in this uh, in this result in this well mathematical result there are several papers about this uh, I chose the one that is more concrete and it actually talks about uh, dimensional variables but we can omit actually talking about dimension uh, but yeah so if we have uh, a probability distribution and we sample k points. Uh, then we can define two values. Um, those two values are very simple values. It, it is just uh, taking a point of, of reference. So for example, zero, the origin, uh, as a point of reference. And then uh, measuring the distance from that point to every other point and taking the maximum and the minimum. So if we take uh, the maximum, um, uh, we name it uh, Tmax. Uh, we do the same with the minimum, we name it the min, and uh, the p is uh, the, the type of norm or the type of distance that we are using. So uh, here, in this case, this is the p norm of x in each case. So as you know, the two norm is the Euclidean distance, the one norm is the Manhattan distance, the infinity norm is uh, the maximum distance, uh, so the maximum distance of each coordinate. Um, we can generalize this to any other Minkowski distance. So if we take the maximum p norm and the minimum p norm, we have this result, and this result says uh, that there exists, there exists a, con a constant, which is named cp, which only depends on p, so it only depends on the type of distance. It doesn't depend on the data. Uh, and it verifies some inequality. And uh, well, this inequality is, a, it may look a little difficult, 
but we can summarize uh, all the consequences in this slide. Uh, so if you see, uh, this is a limit as n tends to infinity. So as we increase the dimension, this expected value uh, tends to be a constant. And between those, uh, between those con constants, exactly. So as we increase the dimension, uh, what we see is that the difference between the maximum and the minimum distances to the reference point, to our zero, they tend to infinity only in the case of, of the Manhattan distance. So uh, this is the only distance that uh, allows us to continue measuring uh, bigger and bigger distances as we increase the dimension. Then if we are using the Euclidean distance, uh, it, te it tends to a constant. So as we increase the dimension, uh, the distances among points tend to stop increasing. And if we are using any other uh, distance with p larger than two, then uh, the difference tends to zero. So uh, this means that if we are increasing the dimension and we uh, measure the farthest point and the nearest point, they are almost the same distance from our reference point. So what we see is that most uh, of our distance metrics are losing significance as dimension increases. So yeah, uh, we increase the n, and then we have and that uh, we can't measure distances anymore. Uh, the other perspective of um, the problems or the the situation that we can have when we increase the dimension is that our data, since it's uh, generally composed of related variables somehow, uh, it is not uh, covering the space uniformly. So actually it, it, it shouldn't because well, it can cover the whole space, but uh, if the variables are related, then it's probably uh, placed into some manifold, which is to say there is a space or a yeah, a surface in our space where um, where the data lives and where we can take uh, coordinates or something and uh, move across that manifold or maybe the data is separated into several groups or something. But uh, since our variables are related, mm, there's probably some situation going on like this. So for example, in our uh, left example, we have a two-dimensional manifold embedded in this three-dimensional space. And in the second example, in the right one, we have a one-dimensional manifold embedded in the three-dimensional space, as you can see. So um, this other approach uh, takes into account the, the relation among variables and says, well, there are probably some hidden variables which are actually generating our data. So this is uh, two ways of, of saying the same. So um, our data can be seen uh, geometrically uh, living in a manifold, or we can also say that uh, there are some hidden variables that are transformed somehow. We don't know how, but they generate uh, the data that we collect. Um, yeah. Mm, these two things are almost the same, um, because in, this manif in these manifolds, we could take coordinates in, in that surface or in this spiral, and uh, we, we would find that hidden variable that we're looking for. So yeah, um, I'll finish this motivation by saying, well, uh, we do not only have uh, problems with uh, classification or with other um, later tax, tasks uh, with uh, our instances uh, when the dimension is high, but uh, we can also solve a lot of more problems if we find a better representation for our data. So for example, uh, first example, obviously classification, uh, we know that if we have a better encoding or a better representation of our samples, if we find the correct features, 
uh, then we can classify better. Um, also, unsupervised classification, so grouping data somehow, or semantic hashing, which is uh, similar to, to, to clustering, but uh, giving each cluster an identifier where uh, similar identifiers uh, denote similar groups. Uh, those problems can also be eased by the use of, of a better presentation. And also, as we will see later, uh, anomaly detection, artificial data generation, and obviously data compression. So yeah, so in this whole uh, motivation section, what I want to say is that learning a representation of instances can serve as a tool to solve many other problems. And this task of finding the, the adequate representation can be called feature learning, feature extra extraction, representation learning, etc. Um, well, uh, we find uh, that our task of finding the correct uh, representation is uh, not supervised. What we mean by this is that uh, we do not know uh, a priori the correct representation of our data. We don't know what is the optimum of the of all the possible representations. So uh, our problem, our representation learning problem, is going to be unsupervised. I'm going to uh, start now with the definition of our autoencoder. So uh, uh, a bit theoretically, what we what we want essentially and what we want in any representation learner is a mapping F from the original feature space to a new feature space, which is encoded, which is uh, of lower dimension somehow. Uh, so this map should uh, transform the original variables. So each instance is mapped to another point in the, in the encoding space. Obviously, uh, our inputs are each one of the samples, and our outputs uh, are each one of the encoder, encodings uh, that we obtain via this mapping. And if we attempt to make a, a neural network out of this, uh, we find that we have our input well defined, we have our output or our desired output. But uh, we don't know. We do not know a way to evaluate or to encourage the network to find a better encoding, since we we do not have uh, a supervised um, version of the problem. So, how can we define a neural network using uh, this output that we don't know? We do not know if it's good or bad. Well instead of uh, directly evaluating the output, which we could do uh, in other cases, uh, what we do in the case of autoencoders is um, finding another mapping, an additional mapping G uh, from the encoding space to the output space, mm, not the output space, the input space, sorry. Um, that should uh, reconstruct the input instance as, as well as possible. So the objective here is that if uh, the encoding is good, then uh, the encoding sh should preserve the enough information so that uh, from that information, we can reconstruct or we can recover the original input data. So if we model the problem like this, then we have uh, our input data, our encoding mapping, our decoding, and then we can evaluate uh, this uh, encoding uh, a, li a little bit indirectly by saying that uh, the distance between the decoding and the original input data should be uh, minimized. That uh, distance function uh, can be uh, one of several. We can use the mean square error, or we can use other kinds of distance in the case of neural networks that we could see later. Um, so the idea here is that 
each one of the codes, so the output of the encoding, should preserve significant information about each individual instance. So the information in the encoding is uh, enough to recover the original data, but all the common information, all, all the common information, which is uh, to say everything that is common to all instances, um, is held instead by the network weights. So instead of uh, preserving that information, it is lost in the encoding, and it is recovered uh, in the decoding because the decoder mapping has all that information built in. So uh, we can see, we can interpret uh, the individual information as the position with, within the manifold, so the coordinates that we are looking for within that manifold, and that common information that is uh, saved in the encoder and the decoder, uh, that should be the manifold structure or how it relates to the original feature space. So the conclusion here is that, that an encoder-decoder architecture can use the inputs as an evaluation tool. So we are supervising the output by using the same input data. Um, and then a little, a li another technical uh, result that says, well, if we are using, well, if we are defining FNG as uh, neural networks, well, they are not any possible function. So if we, if we try to find the, the optimum uh, representation, are we sure that we are going to find it? Well, they are not any function because they are parameterized functions. Uh, they are actually neural networks. But uh, this theoretical result says that mm, we can approximate any measurable function or any continuous function by using these kinds of neural networks. So in general, well, this version of the theorem says uh, that there is a single layer fit for one network that approximates any measurable function to uh, our desired degree of accuracy on some compact set. So this is a very general result in terms of what kind of functions we can approximate. So we can approximate almost anything that is uh, measurable, that is uh, simple enough. Uh, but this version of the theorem uses a single, single layer uh, sigmoidal uh, networks, in fact. Uh, but we can see that in the same paper that I'm referencing here, uh, we can see other similar results, extensions of these results to multi-layer networks and also other activation functions. So not only the sigmoid function can be used as an activation, but also ReLU, also any other modern well-known activation function. Um, so yeah, mm, we can use any general neural network to approximate any function in general, any simple function. So in our case, uh, our autoencoder is composed of these two functions. And uh, the first one is a composition of several layers. Each layer uh, is a typical neural network layer. If it's totally connected, fully connected, uh, it looks like this. So a matrix uh, times uh, the input data plus a um, bias vector. And we can, we can apply our activation function, which is usually applied component by component in, uh, yeah, in the, to the result of this uh, computation. Each one of the layers of the decoder looks the same, but instead of uh, changing the dimension after the encoding, they take the, encod the encoding and so the code uh, output from the encoder and uh, transform uh, that uh, up, to, up to the original uh, dimension and uh, up to the original input data, supposedly. 
But, uh, well, obviously these uh, matrices and these unbiased vectors are learnable. So this, these are the kind of things that the neural network is going to optimize. And the sigma are uh, activation functions, which are nonlinear, because if we, if we don't have uh, nonlinearities in this expression, then we cannot approximate any kind of function. So these are essential, but these are also uh, very good for parallel computation because we are using mostly linear computation. Uh, so that can be done very fast in GPUs and also um, activation functions that can be applied independently to each component. So they can be applied in parallel. Um, well, uh, what about convolutions, right? Uh, because these, these are the famous neural networks. So convolutional neural, net, neural networks can also be uh, expressed uh, in this definition as a matrix product. If we, well, there is an expression that can be achieved by unrolling the, the convolution. So it can be expressed as a matrix product instead of a, well, of a convolution of a sliding window in, a, in the parameter matrix. matrix. So, so yeah, they also uh, apply to this uh, definition. So in summary, uh, our, our autoencoder architecture looks a little bit a little bit like this. There is our encoder, which takes uh, the original data. This could be an, an image. This could be uh, any input vector, and maps it uh, to some uh, kind of uh, code. And that code should uh, preserve all the necessary information to then recover the original data. So the original data is only uh, recovered uh, by only knowing that code and the weights of the decoder, which represent that uh, general structure of the data. Um, so yeah. Uh, I'm going to go through a, a very simple example very fast, and then I'm going to talk about the applications, which I guess they're probably more interesting than the rest of the talk. So um, in our example, we're going to take uh, some uh, data from a, a satellite, uh, from satellite images, where each row, so each sample is, uh, corresponds to a pixel in, in that image and its neighbors, so it's, it's neighboring eight pixels around uh, the center pixel. Instead of having, instead of having uh, the color of each, of each pixel, we have uh, some multispectral values. So in total, we have four bands for each one of the pixels and we have in total nine pixels. So we have uh, 30, 36 features. So uh, well, this is a um, this is a simple enough uh, data set, so we can uh, play a, a little with it and define a basic autoencoder which finds a good encoding for for this for this case. Uh, I'm also going to give um, the corresponding Keras code because it's so easy that everyone is going to understand it. So for example, if we define this uh, autoencoder, we have uh, the input data, which is composed of these 36 variables. We have our encoder. So these, these layers are compacting the, the data, uh, first to eight variables and then to two variables only. Uh, why do we want two variables? Because in this case, we are going to use uh, are variables only for visualization purposes. Uh, we could uh, increase the number of uh, variables in the code if we are going to use them for other purposes. So later we have the decoder, which is composed of these two layers. First, mm, recovering the intermediate dimension, eight variables, and uh, later the ori original 36 variables. So 
uh, all of these all of these layers are fully connected. So I, what I mean by this is they are using matrix products instead of convolutions. So uh, these are mm, known as dense layer in Keras. So if we are going to implement this, then we need to specify the number of variables that we want. So in the first layer, we want eight. In the second layer, we want two. And up to this layer, we would have the encoder. Then we will have the decoder, which augments the dimension to eight and then to 36. We can also, and we must, as we saw in the theoretical universal approximation result, we must apply some nonlinear activation functions so that the, the encoder and the decoder are general enough to, to find, uh, well, to approximate uh, a good uh, encoding, a good encoded mapping. So in this case, we're using, well, uh, some modern activation functions as are, such as uh, the CELU. In the output, we uh, cannot use uh, a nonlinear activation function in this case, at least, because uh, we want to recover the original data. And if we uh, pass the, the reconstruction through an activation function, uh, that may change the range of uh, the data. So for example, if we used a sigmoid activation function in the output or a softmax activation function in the output, uh, like we do with uh, classification, uh, then we are changing the range of the data. And if the original data, for example, is between 0 and 255, if we apply a sigmoid function, then we cannot obtain uh, data in that range at all. So. We are using, in this case, a linear activation function. If we know for sure that our data is in the 0, 1 range, so in the 0, 1 integral, then uh, we can apply a sigmoid activation function in the output, so in the reconstruction, and uh, this will facilitate uh, the autoencoder tasks, the autoencoder task a bit. So, um, in Keras, to concatenate those layers, we can use a sequential model. There are several, there are several interfaces uh, so as to implement uh, models, but the easiest one is sequential. And uh, since this is a very bas basic example, we can use it here. So yeah, um, a sequential model uh, accepts a list of layers and it just concatenates uh, all of them in, in a sequence. Um, well, it's easy enough. Uh, and then, uh, well, for our, for our autoencoder, we need uh, another sequential model. But and the, um, the advantage here is that uh, any sequential model can also be used as a layer. So we can concatenate those two models as if they were layers as well. Um, so as you see, we are defining those three models, the encoder, the decoder, and then the autoencoder in Keras. Uh, why do we need this? Well, uh, we need this because uh, the autoencoder is the, is the network that we are going to train. But uh, in order to capture those uh, codes or those encodings from the original data, we need the encoder. So later after training, uh, we will need the encoder to obtain all of those codes, all of those representations. And uh, if we are going to try and, and reconstruct uh, a, a given code, uh, then we need the decoder. The decoder is not strictly necessary in all uh, cases, but uh, we will see later that it can be useful as well. So um, if we have trained already our autoencoder and we have uh, selected a test subset of our data, and then we have obtained uh, all of the encodings of our test subset, 
uh, well, we can see uh, that if we obtain two variables, then we can plot them uh, in a scatter plot like this. And uh, one important uh, point is that our optimizer, since it's, since it's uh, stochastic, uh, it can and it will produce uh, different results in different runs. But in general, if um, if the manifold where the data lies is not very difficult to find, it will probably find it and uh, place uh, the encodings somehow uh, similarly to other runs. So in this case, uh, we we could repeat and obtain similar results. We we would obtain the maybe the same graph but rotated or something like that. If um, well, you see that these are the encodings, but if we apply uh, colors and shapes according to the class of each uh, data point, then uh, we can see that the, the the codes that were found by the autumn color were very meaningful and they have some relation to the classes, although they didn't, uh, well, the autumn color didn't have any information, any direct information about the classes. So yeah, uh, since it's, it's not supervised at all, it doesn't know how to group the data or how to compact it or anything. But in this case, uh, we can find that these uh, yellow uh, instances are uh, good, well, are well separated enough from the rest. Then we have a red group, then we have this green group, and then there are three groups that are sort of overlapping each other. But if we see the, the legend um, in these uh, kinds of images, uh, these three classes are very similar because they are gray soil, also another type of gray soil, damp gray soil, and very damp gray soil. So these three classes are similar and that's why, uh, well, the images are similar or the pixels are similar, and the autumn color found that the codes should also be, be similar. Uh, but yeah, we can see that the, the, the encoding were the encoding was uh, pretty meaningful. And if we uh, tried now to, to to train a classifier using this encoding, well, it could have a very good uh, result uh, in this case. So yeah, uh, we're going to advance now to the application section. And um, well, I think this would be uh, more interesting to more people and maybe it will inspire some ideas that, well, or problems where uh, autumn colors could be applied. Well, um, so re remember that our general structure looks like this, uh, our input, our encoding, our and our output. Um, if we if we were using the model interface in Keras, we would have to do something like this: our data input, and our decoder applied to our encoder applied to our data input to have the autoencoder model. But yeah, we need those three models: the encoder to encode the data, the decoder to generate new data, and the autoencoder to train and reconstruct the data. Um, so in our first example, uh, which is noise reduction. The idea here is to improve the, the model that we are finding of the manifold and also to reduce possible noise in the input uh, data. Uh, how we achieve this is literally inputting noisy data and instead of, the, of reconstructing the same noisy data, trying to reconstruct the clean data. And uh, I'm going to show you a couple of examples. In this one, we are using uh, a fairly common uh, image data set, which is SL10, uh, STL10, sorry. Uh, it has bigger images than uh, uh, CIFAR or all other data sets. So it's a more complex example, but you can see that for example, in, in images that have sky, the noise has been greatly reduced. So, and using this convolutional autoencoder, which is not very complex, we are achieving pretty good results. 
Uh, from the literature, we can find many, many examples using the noise and autoencoders. And one example that catch my eye was uh, trying to reconstruct noisy images from telescopes and trying to find the original point where a, a source of light uh, is found in, in the image of a telescope. And in this case, these are the original images and the second and fourth rows show uh, noisy ver versions. And then uh, these uh, two rows show the reconstructed versions without the noise. And we can see that the uh, source point of the light is uh, very well identified. In, uh, well, other application is anomaly detection. So our idea here is to find, uh, with using only an autoencoder train in normal data, we are trying to find uh, abnormal uh, instances or anomalous points or outliers. So um, our assumption here is that an autoencoder train on normal data should not be able to reconstruct anomalous data. So for example, if we are training on autoencoder on only uh, uh, images of monuments, then it should not be able to reconstruct images of other kinds. For example, image, images of landscapes. It probably will introduce a lot of noise, so the reconstruction will be bad and the reconstruction error will be high. So this is our anomaly score, the reconstruction error of the, of the data. In this case, uh, the case that I implemented was uh, using a data set of uh, attacks in networks, so uh, requests to a server that are not, uh, are not legal or not uh, normal. And the autoencoder was trained with only normal data. Uh, but then the unit testing, we introduced uh, a lot of uh, the, a lot of attacks, so a lot of uh, requests of this kind. And you can see that the blue portion of the data is the normal portion. And in this uh, section, the reconstruction error is kept at a low point, and it generally uh, doesn't go high. And then in the rest of the section, we have a lot of uh, anomalous requests, so a lot of attacks. And all of the purple points, or all of the purple lines are those uh, alarms, so those uh, requests that were correctly identified as attacks. And yellow points are those uh, that were not identified as, uh, as attacks, but they were. But since they are very near other attacks, generally we can uh, sound the alarm where there is a section with several uh, consecutive um, anomalous points. A similar approach uh, was found in this uh, example for gravitational wave detection. So you know that, well, gravitational, gravitational waves are uh, very, very small uh, disturbances or they present very small disturbances in, in uh, these uh, time series, uh, which are captured in the, in the LIGO systems. So uh, it is uh, then they, the authors uh, apply the, the, no the noise and autoencoder to try and uh, find an, or model what were the normal noise of the LIGO system and then um, sound an alarm or, or catch and the, the gravitational wave where the data or the uh, time series looked different. So yeah, they are modeling that noise so that when the noise is different, they are catching a gravitational wave. The last example that I'm gonna uh, talk about is instant generation. So instant generation is something that you uh, will have seen a lot in the latest months probably. Uh, for example, this uh, example became um, very viral. So this person does not exist.com is, well, that is not made with an autoencoder, but with a gun. Uh, but yeah, this is the sort of uh, generative problem that can be also modeled uh, with, um, with an autoencoder. There are a whole category of there is a whole category of photoencoders named 
gener uh, generative autoencoders or generative models that can uh, do these kinds of things. So it generates from the decoder using those coordinates or using random coordinates, trying to uh, try to generate a uh, new data that fits within the original distribution, but uh, it doesn't look like any of the original instances. So our method uh, in the case of autoencoders is learning probability distributions instead of codes. Uh, in the case of variational autoencoders, this is what we are doing. In the case of adversarial autoencoders, this is uh, a bit more complex because they are using uh, ad an additional uh, neural network trying to discriminate uh, uh, the generating noise. Um, well, in the case of variational autoencoders, uh, this is similar, and the structure is similar to a normal autoencoder, but instead of having directly an encoding layer where each uh, original point is mapped to another point, uh, each one of the original points is mapped onto a whole uh, Gaussian distribution with a, with a certain mean and uh, uh, variance. Um, and then from that uh, distribution, we take a sample and then we compute uh, the output. So the decoder, which is this section, uh, the decoder is the same or looks the same as, as before, but the encoder, instead of mapping uh, onto a point, it maps onto a, a distribution. In uh, the implementation, instead of, well, since estimating, uh, uh, since extracting a sample from uh, an arbitrary Gaussian distribution is not easy. Uh, there is a trick, a reparameterization trick, which serves to estimate uh, a sample from that distribution. So from uh, this mu and this uh, sigma, uh, we can extract a sample by using one uh, from the standard normal distribution, uh, which, well, in one variable, it would look like something like this, just uh, multiplying the 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 sample, the standard sample, uh, by the standard deviation and uh, adding the the mean. Uh, this is an example from the literature, uh, again from the field of astronomy, and uh, this variation of color was trained to separate galaxies in images. So first, the autoencoder was trained with uh, uh, images that only had uh, one uh, galaxy inside. So we can only see one galaxy in all of these set of images. So uh, the encoder tra was trying to find this map to a, a Gaussian, Gaussian distribution. And then from that distribution, taking a sample, we found uh, the output uh, image and it was trying to, to obtain the same. So uh, now if we input a different uh, coordinate in that, uh, in that uh, manifold or in that um, embedding, then we only obtain images with one galaxy. So uh, later the authors uh, retrained the encoder, but only the encoder using images with several overlapping galaxies. And uh, what they found is that uh, during testing, they can apply an image that has several galaxies and uh, the decoder, which only knows how to reconstruct images with one galaxy, uh, did that. Uh, so they, they obtain images with uh, the largest galaxy or the most uh, a notable galaxy separate from the rest. So yeah, uh, I'm going to finish by talking about uh, where you can find uh, these, autoenco these autoencoders. Um, in deep learning libraries, there are usually not uh, many implementations or not, not many generic implementations of autoencoders. So for example, you, you can always find uh, the most popular CNNs, but uh, there are not mm, any popular autoencoders uh, 
already prepared for you to use. So uh, you need to either manually uh, implement them in Keras or in PyTorch, or maybe use a generic implementation that lets you define more or less the structure, but uh, takes care of the rest of having uh, multiple models of training the autoencoder, of having the encoder encode all the data and that. And this, this, these implementations are, are scarce, as I say. Uh, one is Ruta, which is our own package for our users. So the interface is really, really simple. It can be used uh, like if you were using PCA or any other kind of uh, transformation of the variables. And uh, another package is uh, autoencoder for Python, which has several uh, variants of autoencoders implemented. But yeah, you can probably find for more complex uh, architectures, you can find specific implementations for concrete applications, but you will have to adapt, adapt them for, for your purposes. And well, uh, about other or future lines of work, um, we are seeing uh, more and more work in uh, generative autoencoders. So in variational and adversarial autoencoders, we are seeing many, many applications. Uh, so that's promising because, uh, well, they apparently find uh, very good manifolds, very good representations. And uh, last, uh, we are probably going to start seeing uh, more and more uh, transformer-based uh, methods because transformers are a, a kind of general uh, neural network that's it, that generalizes even the, the fully connected layer. So instead of having fixed weights uh, for all the data, it uh, learns also to adapt the weights to each uh, data, to each input instant that, that uh, is, it is fitted. So we are pro probably going to see more of those and this can have also uh, encoder decoder architectures. So yeah, these are somehow related to autoencoders. And well, that's all for me. Uh, thank you very much for listening. And if you have any questions now, feel free to, to ask them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David, uh, for your nice presentation. And um, it, uh, from my point of view, I have to say again, that you surprised me with the, the content of the presentation. Thank you very much. So it's time for questions. So have anybody any question? Okay, if any of you uh, have any question, please uh, um, stand your hand or write something in the chat. Okay, so I guess that you can use the option of uh, raise your hand or not. No, it's not here. But anyway, if any, any of you have a question, write uh, uh, your name in the chat. I think the raise your hand is in the participant list. It's in the participant. Oh, ah, OK, OK, OK. <laughs> sorry, sorry. It was. OK. So. Paco, would you do you want to start uh, the question the questions time? Paco, the uh, the microphone. Sorry. Yes, let me. No, I have no question because I am co-author of the of David with the other paper. I know in fact I was working yesterday in these slides for another additional presentation. But okay, a question. David, uh, you are developing uh, the, uh, the use of the encoder really is very flexible because uh, you can use different uh, fitness functions, fit, different adjectives, and you can uh, consider the transformation. Really, you, we, we have the, the, the neck, and really, when we, we determine the, the, the variables for the new representation, we can uh, define different kind of, 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 of function for, for evaluation, and, and we can try to separate the classes if we are working or speaking about classification in different ways. You are working now, in fact, in this, uh, this approach. Uh, could you uh, present some uh, so discuss some ideas about your current work? Uh, 
with mm -hmm. autoencoders? Sure. So, um, yeah, uh, exactly. We can, uh, although, well, I didn't go into much detail about uh, yeah, uh, objective functions or loss functions, but in general, we mainly used the distance between the um, decoded data and the input data. So uh, the main loss function is taken from here, from that uh, uh, point in the output space. But uh, as you say, uh, we can't take into account the encodings. So there are several ways to take uh, the encodings into account. Uh, usually what we do is to apply, uh, so if our loss function is uh, j, then uh, this is the distance between the original data and the reconstructed version. And J can be um, using not only the distance, but also a penalization, which we usually uh, name omega, uh, that can be uh, drawn from the encodings. So uh, one option, for example, that I didn't actually talk about uh, was uh, in the case of uh, manifold learning, uh, if we are trying to use untangled for manifold learning, we can apply an additional uh, penalizing term that uh, tries to find uh, uh, encodings where the local structure of the points is uh, preserved. So that is uh, that is called a contractive autoencoder, and that is very well known. And that is published. And what we are working now, uh, indeed, is to, is to try and uh, find encodings that also attempt to separate the classes. So in this case, this will be a supervised version of the autoencoder. And what we are trying to do is applying uh, not a classifier, but something here uh, in the encoding that uh, matches with the classes. And, uh, uh, and well, and that the encoding attempts to, to separate. So uh, separati separability measures such as uh, the Fisher discriminant ratio, ratio can be used. We also found that uh, a, very, uh, a very good uh, ap approach uh, for this uh, purpose was using a, a least, uh, least square support vector machine uh, a linear approach uh, for separa separating um, and data according to only the, the encodings. So yeah, we can take into account the encodings also in the, in the loss function. And we generally use this, use uh, penalizing terms uh, added to the, to the reconstruction error. Thank you, David. Um, uh, Ignacio? Ignacio yes. Vida, go ahead. Yes, yes. Well, first of all, um, thank you very much for the talk, David. It was really nice. And uh, I want to focus on my question a little bit on uh, time series because I think you've uh, talked once about time series in the in the slides, in the in the one in the slide in which you talked about uh, anomalous detection in um, mm. on a, uh, internet attacks, I think. Um, but you didn't mention uh, LSTM uh, layers in these kind of problems, which I think uh, could be interesting. And I want to uh, ask your opinion about these uh, kind of models, uh, LSTM autoencoder models for encoding and uh, time series. Hmm. Okay, so yeah, LSTM autoencoder models are used a lot in um, in other problems such as translation or problems like that, or uh, music encoding. Uh, there is a, a very popular model called uh, music vibe, which is made out of, well, it, it is a variational encoder, which is made of LSTMs and, and other, well, other components. And, um, and yeah, there are many, many uh, applications of, of LSTM-based autoencoders as well. For anomaly detection, in this case, in this case, uh, what I am using is a, a, a basic autoencoder, so a totally connected uh, 
version of, of autoencoder. And uh, so obviously it takes uh, into account each point independently from the rest. So uh, you are right that an LSTM based autoencoder will be uh, with uh, would have an advantage uh, from this in that uh, it would take into account the current point and the ones before probably. So if an anomaly was detected, it probably uh, it probably would uh, interfere with the next data. So if the next data is kind of uh, an anomaly, it would also also uh, mark those as an anomaly. So yeah, I I haven't found uh, maybe I haven't looked for for LSTM autocoders for anomaly detection, but I'm sure that some somebody uh, is, is is using them for for time series. Yes, yes, I have read already some papers uh, yeah. discussing this theme, but uh, it is really interesting to me that when they use this kind of uh, architecture they tend to use several uh, LSTM layers to achieve the encoding. And mm -hmm. I'm not fully sure how useful it is to uh, chain two, three, four LSTM layers. When does the temporal dependency uh, doesn't get any farther? Do you know what, I, what, I, what I'm trying to say? Maybe in the second or third layer, there isn't already any temporal dependency to keep on adding uh, pure mm. LSTM layers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand what you say. Um, I don't know much about uh, problems with time series, but uh, no, you're right. Uh, maybe it's using them to take into account more, but probably not, I don't know. Uh, uh, maybe they can, uh, use other kinds of layers in the subsequent uh, sta stages of the encoding, but I don't know. I I have seen, as you say, um, stacked uh, LSTMs for, for encoding and on decoding. But uh, in general, mm, they are less, uh, so the amount of LSTM layers is probably less than for example, in a convolutional autoencoder, we would have many, many uh, layers stacked on top, of, on top of each other. So maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe you have seen uh, a lot of LSTM layers stacked in an autoencoder. Uh, yeah, the examples that I've uh, faced in, uh, in the papers are kind of like this. Maybe they try to uh, use convolution first and then LSTM. Mm. or they try just pure LSTM layers mm. uh, to achieve the encoding and the decoding, which is uh, surprisingly surprising for me because I don't, I don't think how you, I don't know how useful could it be to decode with LSTM as well. Mm. Yeah, that is interesting. I don't know that uh, the, the, in the coding part, I understand that uh, maybe not in uh, direct autoencoding. So if we are trying to recover the same uh, data, maybe it's not so necessary so many LSTMs, but uh, in translation or other problems, uh, you do need it because uh, you may have to change uh, uh, places of some words or something. Probably needed. I don't know. I haven't worked so much with LSTMs. So yeah. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you for the discussion and uh, and congratulations for the talk. Thanks. Thank you, Ignacio, for the question. Any more questions? I encourage you to make questions. Okay. Uh, we listened to, uh, to a very good uh, and high level presentation about autoencoders. So, and I guess that it's. Uh, uh, you can use certain colors in whatever your uh, PhD tasks. So any more questions related to your um, topics uh, that you're working on? So uh, if um, I have a question, okay. 
So Ignacio um, asked you about, okay, what about the use of LSTM in autoencoders? So, but um, my question is a little bit related to, to the Ignacio's ones uh, in the sense that your last slide was a focus on the use of transformers, okay? So transformers, so, um, they don't use any recurrent neural network or any convolutional neural network, okay? They are focused on the use of the Attention, attention mechanism. Have you uh, read any paper about the use of this kind of architecture, the transform architecture, to other problems different from natural language processing? Ah, yes. The, there is a, a recent uh, paper that shows how uh, a transformer can be modified to also treat images instead of uh, just natural language. Uh, yeah, and and they use the same mechanism. I don't know all the details, but in general, you, I, I think you could apply this to to anything because it's a kind of a fully connected uh, layer. But uh, the attention mechanism allows to change the the weight uh, according to the data point that is fitted to the network. So in a general sense, that's uh, how um, they explained it in the uh, paper about images with transformers. Um, yeah, I do not know now the reference, but there's yeah. one and there is a very explanatory video about how they work. Okay, so on my last, last, it's not a question, okay, it's a kind of request, okay, uh, in order to finish the, um, this uh, seminar. How can you advise to all the audience about, okay, you need to use autoencoders, so what is the most important part of the use of autoencoders, okay? If you have uh, any sentence to recommend the use of autoencoders in other tasks. In general, um, a very good use of autoencoder and, and a very easy one is to uh, try and visualize your data uh, first instead of mm, directly trying to um, apply any machine learning uh, algorithm, you can try and see uh, the, be the behavior of the data using a, an autoencoder. You can also use uh, other approaches as, such as TSNE. So TSNE is a very, very good uh, tool for visualization of data in uh, two dimensions or three dimensions. And um, yeah, you can use autoencoders and TSNA, TSNA for, for those purposes. So yeah, in exploratory data analysis can be very useful. You find that your uh, encoded features are not uh, very useful then you can just continue with your work. It could be useful. Okay, thank you very much, uh, David. If uh, there aren't any more questions about any people, okay. I don't know if Paco want to say something before uh, closing, okay. Uh, before presenting, okay, the next se session of uh, uh, seminars. Do you want to say something, Paco? Or, yes, uh, yes. No, no, only, but in Spanish. Uh, Perfecto. Desear a todos unas felices fiestas y un importante y merecido descanso en estos días, puesto que hemos tenido un año complicado, peculiar, difícil y bueno, todo, todo lo que ha sido esta, este cambio de trabajar online está siendo muy complicado para todos, así que que disfrutéis en familia, que os cuidéis, tengáis cuidado y, y descanséis y carguéis pilas. Así que nos vemos a la vuelta los seminarios en cuanto volvamos de, de enero, después de Reyes, Mm. Y volveremos, y bueno, pues a muchos de vosotros, a algunos todavía los veré entre hoy y mañana. Estoy viendo a Alberto Castillo, le aviso que, que ahora después le escribo para vernos mañana con, con eh, Natalia, lo comentaba, no, no sabéis si antes estaba, y algunos os veré, voy a mandar con los que trabajo directamente, voy a mandar algunos mensajes para intentar tener mañana tarde reuniones con todos los que pueda, y al resto, bueno, y a los que no vea, pues pasarlo bien y nos vemos a la vuelta. Un abrazo. Vale, pues muchas gracias Paco y simplemente comentar igualmente. Feliz Navidad a todos 
y volvemos el 11 de, el 11 de enero, volvemos con una con un online seminars eh, con el profesor Dirk Hobby, eh, que nos va a hablar sobre Five Sources of Biases and Ethical Issues in NLP and what uh, I want to do about them. So, por mm -hmm. tanto, una, una charla en cuanto a sesgo, a sesgo en, en datos. Bien, pues nos vemos el 11 de... Un, de, un detalle, Nuria y... Eugenio, pero Nuria no está ahora mismo. Envía... Eh, David tiene tres referencias básicas que están en sus transparencias. Eh, en el Universidad de tiene tres referencias básicas, pero particularmente un overview y un paper reciente sobre la aplicación de Newton Coder. Eh, pásele la referencia a Eugenio y la envía, porque bueno, yo creo que es una lectura interesante. Los Newton Coders se están aplicando prácticamente en todos los campos y entonces es una lectura interesante para para muchos de los que trabajan con Machine Learning puede tenerlo como referencia en, en su trabajo. Así que merece la pena las dos referencias de, de David. ¿Vale? Eh, sí, cuando enviemos el vídeo, como esto se está hablando, cuando enviamos el vídeo, pues enviaremos la bibliografía de David. David, pues cuando puedas, pues me la envías por correo y mm. luego lo circulamos a todo el mundo. Pues de nuevo, nos vemos el 11 de enero. Feliz Navidad a todos, feliz entrada de año y nada. Que en breve nos vemos aquí de nuevo y descansar y pasar un buen tiempo en vuestra familia. Adiós. Hasta luego.